Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 25 of Introductory Linear Algebra. This video is going to be our last lecture about invertibility of matrices. So we're just going to introduce two final results about matrix inverses, just to round out our toolbox concerning the subject. Okay, so to motivate our first theorem that we're going to go through in today's lecture, I'm going to start off by going all the way back up to the definition of the inverse of a matrix that we saw originally a few lectures ago. Okay, so remember the inverse of a matrix, it is a matrix, a inverse, with the property that if you multiply it by a on either side you get the identity matrix okay so we always had to be careful that we checked whether or not it was an inverse on the left and on the right so when we went through this example for example you know we multiplied both ways and we had to check that we got the identity matrix both ways no matter what order you multiply the matrix matrices in okay well now we're going to introduce a theorem that says well no actually that's overkill you don't have to multiply it both ways as long as it looks like an inverse from one side or the other then it actually is the inverse, okay? So here's the theorem. Suppose you got some square matrix, okay? Well, if you ever find any matrix B such that AB equals the identity or BA equals the identity, then actually that matrix B must be the inverse. The matrix A must be invertible and B is the inverse of A. In other words, you don't have to check multiplication on both sides. You only have to check one or the other. If either of them is the identity, then the other one must be the identity automatically for free. So another way of thinking about this is, even though matrix multiplication in general is not commutative, this is sort of one special case where it is commutative, okay? If you get AB equals the identity, you know right away that BA must also be ident the identity. So in this special case, commutativity does work. All right, so let's go through a proof of this, okay? And we're gonna prove it assuming that B times A equals the identity, okay? You can prove it assuming that A times B equals the identity too, I mean, uh, nothing drastically changes, but we're just going to pick one of the starting points and go through that, okay? So suppose that B times A equals the identity. Our goal is to show that B is the inverse of A. Okay, well, consider this equation here, AX equals zero. That's a system of linear equations, right? And we saw a couple theorems ago that there's this nice connection between invertibility and systems of linear equations. So if we can prove something about this linear system here, in particular, if we can show that it has a unique solution, then we'll know that A must be invertible. So that's our goal here. Let's show that this linear system must have a unique solution. Okay, well, the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this linear system AX equals zero. I'm going to multiply it on the left by B and see what happens. Okay, well, one thing that happens is BAX, that's if I just introduce parentheses here, that's B times AX and AX equals zero, right? So I can just sub that in. So it's B times zero. And anything times the zero vector is just the zero vector, okay? So BAX must equal zero. But on the other hand, we can also group parentheses in BAX a little bit differently. If we group parentheses differently, then we can group the parentheses around BA. And then what we get is, well, BA times X. Well, what is BA though? BA is the identity matrix, so I can plug that in, okay? BA is the identity matrix, so I get that's equal to identity times X, which of course is just X itself. Okay, now we play our usual game of sort of tracing the equalities through x equals this equals this equals this duh, 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 equals zero. Okay, so if ax equals zero and ba equals i, then x must equal zero as well. In other words, what we've shown here is that this linear system ax equals zero has a unique solution. We've shown that if this happens, if ax equals zero, then x must equal zero. So that's the unique solution. Okay, but wait. Now we go back up to our characterization of invertible matrices. So big, by our big theorem that had like a laundry list of invertibility is equivalent to this and this and this and this and this, that theorem told, that, told us that, hey, if AX equals zero has a unique solution, then A must be invertible. Okay, so we've shown that now. We've shown that, hey, if BA equals I, then A is invertible. We haven't quite shown that B is the inverse yet though, but fortunately we can do that easily now. Okay, now that we know that A is invertible, we can multiply A by its inverse. Okay, so in particular, I'm gonna take this equation here, BA equals I, and multiply it by the inverse, A inverse, now that I know that it exists. Okay, if I multiply on the right in particular by A inverse, then I get an A inverse over here, and I get an A inverse over here, and the A and the A inverse cancel, I'm just left with B equals A inverse. Okay, so just take this equation and multiply on the right by A inverse, and you're gonna find that, yeah, B equals A inverse, and then you're done, okay? That's all we wanted to show, okay? We've shown that A is invertible, and B really is the inverse, just based on that one-sided product this time, though. Okay, and you can prove it the other way as well, okay? So you can also prove the case that if AB equals the identity matrix, then A is invertible and B is the inverse as well. 
All right, so all those times that we did checked two-sided multiplication, it was overkill. Don't need to do that for inverses. One-sided is enough. All right, and then the final theorem for this week says that, well, if you're working with two by two matrices, you can actually get an explicit formula for the inverse of that matrix. So if you don't like doing that method from the previous class where you take the two by two matrix, put it on the left, augment with an identity and row reduce, you can use this method instead to get an explicit formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix, if it exists, okay? For three by three and larger, it turns out there's an explicit formula for the inverse of a three by three matrix and a four by four and so on for no matter what size you like, but they're actually absolutely horrendous to use. No one uses them in practice. Okay, so if you're working with a three by three matrix or larger, just do the row reduction method from previous class. Okay, augment with identity and row reduce. All right, well, what is the explicit formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix? Okay, so suppose that your matrix, just given names to its entries, A, B, C, and D. Then that matrix, it turns out it's invertible if and only if A times D minus B times C does not equal zero. So this funny little quantity, A times D minus B minus, sorry, A times D minus B times C, that has to be non-zero. Okay, and if it is invertible, in, in other words, if this quantity here is non-zero, then we have an explicit formula for the inverse. A inverse equals this junk here. And you can sort of see now why, oh, we need AD minus BC to be non-zero, so I could divide by it here. Okay, and the inverse, you just divide by that funny little quantity there, and you swap the diagonal entries, right? Originally the diagonal entries were A and D, now they're D and A. And you stick a minus sign on the off diagonal entries. So B and C became minus B and minus C. All right, so let's see where this comes from. Let's show that this actually is the inverse of the two by two matrix A that we started with, okay? And remember, the way that you can show matrices are inverses of each other is you just multiply them together, right? If I give you a proposed inverse, you can check whether or not it actually is the inverse just by doing the multiplication and seeing if you get the identity matrix after you, multiplying it, after you multiply them together. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do A inverse times A equals this junk here. So here's A inverse, here's A. Let's do our matrix multiplication, multiply them together. Okay, you get a big ugly mess, Right, you get D times A minus B times C in the top left entry. And similarly, D times B minus B times D in the top right entry, and so on for all the other entries. But the miraculous thing that happens is, hey, look in the top left entry here. That's exactly A, D minus B, C. So the thing that I'm dividing by cancels out with it. I get a one in that top left corner. Here I've got D, B minus D, B. Oh, zero in the top right corner. They cancel with each other. Here's A, C minus A, C, zero in the bottom left. And here's AD minus BC in the bottom right. Again, the thing that I'm dividing by. So in the top left and bottom right, I do get one. And in the bottom left and top right, I do get zero. I get the identity matrix. Okay, and by the previous theorem, it's enough to check that one-sided product. If I wanted to, I could check A times A inverse as well, but you don't need to, okay? You don't have to check the multiplication the other way anymore. All right, so that proved sort of half of the theorem. That showed that here, hey, if AD minus BC does not equal zero, then the matrix is invertible and this is the inverse. Okay, I also have to show that if AD minus BC equals zero, then the matrix is not invertible. Okay, and be a little bit careful here. It's tempting just to say that, oh, well, this formula doesn't work because you can't divide by zero. But that's not a valid proof because it doesn't show that there's not some other matrix that's the inverse in this case, okay? We have to show that if AD minus BC equals zero, then there's no inverse whatsoever, okay? Not just this formula, but no inverse anywhere. All right, so that's what we gotta show now to round out this proof and finish it off. Okay, so if AD minus BC equals zero, well, I'll just rearrange that a little bit. That means that AD equals BC, and I'm gonna split into a couple cases and show that in each of these cases, nah, the matrix isn't invertible. All right. So case one, what happens if either A equals zero or B equals zero? Okay, well, let's imagine A equals zero. Then on the left-hand side, I get A times D. Well, that's zero equals B, C. So at least one of B or C must be zero as well. So A equals zero and either B or C is zero. So I go back up to my matrix. What's that tell me? A is zero and either B or C is zero. So either I get a zero row at the top or I get a zero column at the left. Okay, so either I get a zero row or zero column. And something similar happens if B equals zero. Okay, if B equals zero, then this right-hand side is zero. So then either A or D is zero. So B is zero and A or D is zero. Okay, let's go back and look at our matrix. B is zero and either A or D is zero. So again, either you get a zero row or you get a zero column. 
Okay, so in case one here, if A or B equals zero, then you know that your original matrix A has a zero row or column. Okay, now I'll come back to that later. Okay, just keep that in the back of your minds for now. Case two, if A and B are both non-zero, okay, so the other possibility, if they're both non-zero, then I can divide by them. So I'm gonna divide this equation, AD equals BC, by A and also by B. I'm gonna divide it by AB. And when I do that, on the left here, I get rid of the A and I have a B on the bottom, so I get D over B. And on the right, the B goes away and I get a C or, and I get an A on the bottom. Okay, so I get C over A on the right. Okay, and this appears a little useless at first glance, but what this equation says is that the bottom row is a multiple of the top row, okay? In that matrix A, the bottom row is a multiple of the top row, okay? Because these ratios are the same, D over B is the same as C over A. If we go back up to that matrix A and see, what does that mean? D over B is the same as C over A. So the ratio of the bottom entries to the top entries is the same in both of the columns, right? This ratio in the right column is the same as this ratio in the left column. Okay, so the bottom row is a multiple of the top row. All right, so one of two things happens. What we showed is that either there's a zero row or zero column, or the bottom row is a multiple of the top row. One of those two things has to happen. And the point is, in either of those two cases, the reduced row echelon form of your matrix is gonna have a zero row, right? If your original matrix has a zero row, then boom, right away, you've got a zero row in a reduced row echelon form as well. If your original matrix has a zero column, then, well, I mean, because your matrix is square, you're gonna get a zero row as well when you start row reducing it here. Like imagine your left row was, or sorry, left column was entirely zeros. Then when you row reduce it, you can use some multiple of B to get D to be zero as well. And then you've got all three of these entries being zero. Okay, so you can get a zero row when you row reduce. Okay, similarly, if your bottom row is a multiple of the top row, then when you row reduce, your row operation is gonna cancel out that entire bottom row and it'll just turn it all into zeros. Okay, so in either of these cases, your reduced row echelon form, it's gonna have a zero row, and therefore your matrix is not invertible because your reduced row echelon form is not the identity matrix. Okay, if it's got a zero row, it's not the identity matrix, so A is not invertible. All right, and then that's it, okay? That's, that's the proof is now done. We've shown both sides of it. We've shown that, hey, if AD minus BC is not zero, it's invertible. And we've shown that if AD minus BC, or sorry, if AD minus BC is not zero, then it is invertible. And if AD minus BC equals zero, then it's not invertible. All right, so let's just do a couple quick examples to, just to sort of illustrate using this theorem. Okay, so let's find the inverse or show that it doesn't exist for a bunch of two by two matrices. So here's one of them, three minus two, one, four. If we wanna use that theorem to determine invertibility, first thing we do is we compute AD minus BC. So it's gonna be 12, carefully double negative 12 plus two, right? Three times four minus minus two times one. Okay, and of course that's 14, which does not equal zero. So that matrix is invertible and we can construct it straight away. You just do one divided by that 14 that we just computed times swap the order of the diagonal entries. So three, four becomes four, three and stick a minus sign on the off diagonal entries. So one minus two became minus one, two. So that's your inverse. And again, if you want to double check that this really is the inverse, just multiply this by this and you'll see, yeah, you get the identity matrix. Or if you wanted to find this inverse the other way via the method from the previous class, you could do that too. If you take this matrix A and augment with an identity matrix and then row reduce, you're gonna find that, yeah, row reduces down to the identity on the left and exactly this junk on the right. So you can get the inverse either way. You have two different methods for two by two matrices now. All right, let's do another example. So the matrix two minus three minus four, six. Okay, again, first thing, compute that quantity AD minus BC. So two times six minus minus three times minus four. So careful, this is the rare triple negatives. Triple negative is negative. You're gonna get 12 minus three times four. So 12 minus 12, which is zero. So the conclusion in this case is no. That matrix is an invertible because that quantity AD minus BC equals zero. Okay, so if you're to try to compute the inverse that other way, right, augment with an identity matrix and then row reduce, you're gonna find that you get a zero row down here when you start row reducing. You're not gonna get the identity matrix on the left. All right, one final example. 
One place where, you know, this method, this sort of explicit formula for 2 by 2 matrices really shines in comparison to the Gaussian elimination method uh, is, you know, when your matrix has really ugly entries. So something like this, pi and 3.5 and minus 2, 6. Certainly we could find the inverse or determine invertibility by augmenting with an identity matrix and then row reducing, but your row operations are going to be ugly, right? You're going to be doing multiples of pi and multiples with decimals in them and stuff like that. Okay, so using this explicit formula is actually rather advantageous in this case because it's easy, uh, easy to check invertibility no matter how ugly your entries are. Okay, so start off by checking AD minus BC again. We're going to get 6 pi, careful of your double negative, 6 pi plus 7, right? AD is 6 times pi, BC is minus 7, and then you subtract it, it becomes plus 7. Okay, so that is not 0, so the inverse exists. And the inverse is just, well, you do 1 divided by that AD minus BC that we computed. So 1 divided by 6 pi plus 7. And then swap the position of the diagonal entries and stick a minus sign in front of the off-diagonal entries. And you're done. That's all there is to it. Okay, but yes, please do keep in mind that you can always, always, always compute the, the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix using whichever of these two methods you like. Okay, so you can use this explicit formula or you can row reduce A augmented with the identity matrix down to identity matrix augmented with the inverse. Okay, that this method down here still works no matter what the size of your matrix is, 2 by 2 or otherwise. Alrighty, so that'll do it for our discussion of invertible matrices, so I will see you next class for week 7.